Our first guest tonight is a number one New York Times bestselling author and the Emmy-winning host of The Rachel Maddow Show, which airs Monday nights at 9 on MSNBC. Her book, Prequel, An American Fight Against Fascism, is on sale now. Please welcome back to the show our friend Rachel Maddow, everybody. <laughs> Now, Thank you're you a very that. busy person. Yes. But you are only doing your show on Monday now, and I'm wondering how you process the news on Tuesday through Friday, because I find it very cathartic to have the show to talk about it. Ah, so yes, the way that my life has changed is that I no longer compartmentalize. Uh -huh. Used to be that I get up in the morning and work all day and then do the show and stop. Now, because there isn't a show Tuesday through Friday, I never stop working, and I work through the weekend, and I never sleep. So, it's awesome. So anybody yeah. who's like, God, she is which is the best life in the world. She only works one day a week. That is patently untrue. So my girlfriend sees me less now than she did when I was on five days a week, and she is mad. Okay. Yes. Well, certainly it does seem like you pulled a fast one. Yes, yeah. exactly. Everybody's mad at me. I'm not on five days a week, <laughs> and I work all the time, and I'm I'm grinding myself into dust. Well, it's I'm perfect. very happy. You look great today. That's Thank the you. important thing. Thank you. Um, Thank you. you uh, we were, I want to talk real briefly before we move on to the book. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of reporting on these early polls that the New York Times did. Uh, Biden behind in a lot of battlegrounds. Yeah. States uh, too early to be concerned if you're the Biden camp or maybe uh, ring the alarm bells. If you work in politics and your job right now is working on the Biden campaign, it is never too early to be concerned. Yes. I feel like they should absolutely panic and also be cognizant of the fact that it is a year out. And like, if you look at Barack Obama a year out from his reelection effort, he was in basically exactly the same position and then handled Mitt Romney very easily when the election came around. So there's sort of reason to chill and reason to panic, and I think they should do both. Just like a mix of chill and panic. Yes, yeah. basically my work life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it does, an interesting thing in the polling is that a conviction against Donald Trump seems to tip some people maybe in the middle against him that are willing yes. to support him uh, based on being indicted uh, four different times and this major civil trial. But if he gets convicted, that's too much. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Like 91 felony criminal charges, you're like, man, it means nothing to me. Yeah. But, but I like that they're those. like, yeah. They're like, if one jury, if 12 other people decide I'm willing to go with them. On one of the 91 counts, yeah, exactly. would flip me. Yeah, I don't know. But that's, that was the finding in that same New York Times poll that freaked everybody out, who was a Biden supporter as of this weekend. They did five of the six swing states had Trump leading, but all six of them basically flipped if Trump is hypothetically convicted of even one of those 91 felonies. So I sort of feel like the one thing that teaches us is that these polls mean nothing. Yeah. And it's time to work very, very hard if you want your chosen candidate to get elected. Yes, and you're right. A year out, a lot can change. Yeah. Um, this is a fascinating book. Thank this you. is a true story. Yeah. And it is one of those true stories that you cannot believe uh, has, was not taught in school or that you haven't just heard from like word of mouth. This is about um, basically a, a fascist effort to overthrow uh, the United States government, uh, uh, people working for Adolf Hitler uh, within elected officials here uh, in this country. How much about this story did you know? What, like, what led you down the, the road to even write it? I knew like the tiniest little bit of this, and I was kind of looking into something else. I was looking into anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial and this other stuff in American history and other times when we've had real problems with that. And I just stumbled into this story of the 40s, and of the 30s and 40s, where there were Americans who were not only not wanting us to fight against the Nazis in World War II, they wanted us to side with the Nazis. Some a significant number of Americans were working for the Germans, and there were two dozen members of Congress and U.S. senators who were involved in a plot with a Nazi agent to do propaganda work for the Nazis in this country using Congress. And it's crazy to me that we didn't know that. I didn't know it. It's even crazier that when they were all put on trial for sedition, there was a mistrial, the judge died in the middle of the trial, and that's how they all got off. Wow. <laughs> yes, I know. Now, do you feel like these stories are not taught because we like the image of America as a country that just fought against the Nazis from beginning to end, and, and at no point did anybody here say, 
you know what? I kind of like what they're saying. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an easier, more comfortable story. It's, you know, one of the moral cornerstones of who we are as a country that we were the good guys and the Nazis were the bad guys and we went over there and fought them and beat them and made that go away. It is a less comfortable story, but also true that there were lots of Americans here who wanted us, if we were gonna fight that war at all, to fight on the other side. And so to me, it's scary because that's a hard thing to know about your own country, but it's also kind of heartening because we know that they didn't win. And there's all these incredible stories about smart, cool, brave, funny Americans who fought against them and who made sure that they didn't get their way and who prosecuted them and exposed them and infiltrated them and spied on them. And um, those stories about Americans who are anti-fascists in the lead up to World War II, those, those are the heroes of the book and they're amazing. You mentioned that you uh, were doing research about anti-Semitism, which sort of led you to this story. Yeah. Obviously, anti-Semitism has been on the rise in recent years, of uh, last month uh, through the roof. Yeah. What have you learned about, or what did you learn about anti-Semitism from researching this story? Thank you for asking that. It's been a really interesting uh, just thing for me personally. I, I'm, I feel like the thing that I have come to understand by looking at the way it operated in other time periods, not just looking at it in other countries, but looking at it in our own country, is that when people are telling you something about a minority group not, that, that says they're not just bad, they're not just things about them that you shouldn't like, but they're evil, that they are secretly powerful, that they're the reason things are bad, that sort of toxic conspiracy theory about a minority group has a purpose. It is always to make us think that we shouldn't be in a, in a democracy. Because right, a democracy is that we all decide things together. That's the basic idea of it. You have to put a seed in people's mind that there are some people among us who aren't just bad, they're dangerous, and they're out to get us, and we need to be protected from them. And therefore, we can't have a democracy, because we can't have those people voting too, and we need, we need a government that's gonna protect us from those dangerous people. That's the purpose of those, not just stereotypes, but those dangerous conspiracy, conspiracy theories about disfavored minority groups. And that form of anti-Semitism is part of fascism. It's part of authoritarianism. It's part of trying to make us give up our democracy. And it's evil and it's pernicious and it keeps repeating itself and it ought to be a big red flag to all of us. It's not just about hating people. It's about getting to, to undo democracy and we shouldn't stand for it. Uh, very well said and it's a really a wonderful book. Thank you. To bring those issues out. I, I do wanna ask, cause you've reported on, on uh, the military over your career. Uh, it's something uh, you know a lot about. So obviously right now, you know, uh, President Biden is urging Israel to limit civilian casualties, yeah. also uh, proposing and wanting to send aid, uh, military aid to Israel. It feels like he's probably also just trying to keep the top on what could be an escalating conflict. Do you feel like, because it does seem like a lot of what he's doing might, from a distance, seem to be in conflict one, with one another. Like, how do you perceive it? I mean, the thing that I have studied and, and written another book about is the relationship between our politics and like our political system and our use of the military. And I feel like we're having another crisis around that right now because like one of the things that's happening, the reason we've got two aircraft carrier strike groups there and, and nuclear powered submarines and all, the, all this huge amount of force that we're sending to the Middle East is not because we're saying, oh, we're gonna put the US military in a frontline war here. It's because we've already got so many American troops in the Middle East, in Iraq, in Syria, and they're actually getting attacked. Our troops that are deployed right now in the Middle East are getting attacked in some of the furor that is erupting in the Middle East over the conflict in Israel and Palestine. And the fact that we just don't ever talk about that, that we've got all these troops out there and we don't think about where they are, means that we're kind of ignorant about having a smart debate about that in the country and we're sort of ignorant about those policy decisions that have to get made. Similarly, with our support of Israel militarily, like we just don't talk that much in our politics. In all, of all the things we fight about in this country, we don't talk that much about where our military is deployed, how we're using military force and how our weapons are being used around the world. And so when it becomes a huge international controversy, we're just ill-equipped to fight well about it from good faith positions. And I think we suffer from not having politics that is connected to our use of military force. It's seen as something that just happens on its own, or we ought to be arguing about it all the time. Well, uh, you've always helped us have smarter conversations, so thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you, To Seth. assist once again. Thank this you. is Rachel Maddow, everybody. Prequel, available now. She'll be leading special post-debate coverage following the Republican 
Debate tomorrow at 10 on MSNBC and Peacock. We'll be right back with Jeff Tweedy.